Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is very disturbing. I feel like this is a case where people might have differing opinions on the root cause as to why this happened. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody's thoughts are on this case. But before I get into it, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Bright Sellers for partnering with me on today's video. Bright Sellers believes that wine is meant to be enjoyed. They are on a mission to bring the fun back into wine by matching people with wines that they will be sure to love. I'm someone who's never really known what kind of wines I like, other than knowing that I generally like sweeter, fruitier flavors. But now with Bright Sellers, they're able to take my preferences and select wines that will match my tastes. All you do is take a quick seven question quiz and you will be matched with wines from all over the world. Then you have endless options when it comes to subscriptions for the wine club. You can choose from over 12 different plan options and get over 100 varieties sourced from more than 80 wine regions delivered straight to your doorstep. I got my box with six different wines and having them delivered every month is actually perfect for my lifestyle. My roommates and I love to do our Wine Wednesdays where we try a new wine each week while we hang out and watch some of our favorite shows or play some games with the charcuterie board. It's the perfect way to try some new wines and unwind with my favorite people. What I love about trying wines from Bright Cellars though is that each one comes with a little wine education card that outlines tasting notes, suggested pairings, best serving temperatures, and their origins. I love white wines and rosés, but I'm also open to trying new things, so I also asked for a red blend. First, I got the Mohave Rain, which is a red blend with flavors of cherry, blackberry, violet, and chocolate, and this one is from California. My roommates are all red wine people, and they love this one. Then, my two favorites were Petal Press Wine Co. and Batik. The rosé has a light, juicy, sweet flavor with hints of lemon, nectarine, watermelon, and rose. Then the Batik has flavors of lime zest, kiwi, ginger, and dried flowers. It's so delicious. I love those too. So if you want to join Bright Cellars Wine Club and get new tastes delivered right to your front door, then Bright Cellars has a special offer for my viewers. For a limited time only, you can get your first six bottle box, which is a $150 value for just $60. Use my link down below or scan the QR code shown here to take the quiz and get your personalized matches. Again, make sure you use my link down below or use the QR code here to get your first six bottle box for only $60. Thank you again so much to Bright Sellers for partnering with me on today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we're going to be discussing the very disturbing murder of Melanie Davis. Melanie Davis was born February 11th, 1967 in Australia before she moved across the world to Bowling Green, Kentucky before moving the family to the quiet small town of Hendersonville, Tennessee. From there, she became married to her husband, Chris Davis. Melanie worked as a paralegal and in her free time, she trained for triathlons. She absolutely loved being active and fit. Chris and Melanie then went on to have two sons, Josh and Zachary. Josh was born in 1996, and Zach was born in July of 1997. By all accounts, Melanie and Chris did their absolute best to raise their boys in a stable, loving home. They were your classic picture of your typical middle-class family. Chris and Melanie loved each other, and they made sure to show their sons how much they loved them. Now, growing up, Josh was known as being outgoing, talkative, and easy to get along with. Meanwhile, his little brother, Zachary, he was known for being a bit of a loner, he was quiet, and he didn't have too many friends of his own. But despite their differences in personalities, Josh and Zach were always very close with one another. But tragedy struck this happy, close-knit family when Zach was only nine years old. Chris had been diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. 
ALS is a rare debilitating neurological disease that attacks your motor neurons within your brain and spinal cord that leads to progressive muscle weakness and eventual paralysis. This disease is progressive and starts with a patient having weakness in their arms and legs until they eventually become unable to walk or get out of bed. They lose their ability to chew food or speak or swallow and eventually the patient's diaphragm and other respiratory muscles become affected which leads to inability to breathe on their own, which ends up with them being ventilated. This is an incurable disease at this point, and most patients die within two to five years of diagnosis, though some patients live as many as 10 years or longer. So truly, it's a debilitating, awful, nasty disease. And unfortunately, Chris died of ALS when his sons were only nine and 10 years old. His death had a truly devastating effect on the family. Zach fell into a deep depression, and those around him started to notice a very obvious shift in his behavior. First, his grandmother, Gail Kahn, she noticed that he became very withdrawn during this time. Then, a teacher of Zach's talked to Melanie because Zach had been drawing disturbing images in school. This included images of people being blown up and things like that. So, because of these notable shifts in behavior, Zach started to receive psychiatric care. Zach first started seeing a psychiatrist named Dr. Bradley Freeman from the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. At first, Zach had a hard time opening up about his feelings and telling Dr. Freeman what was going on. He hardly even answered his questions at first. However, he did eventually open up to him about how deep of a depression he was in. He also told Dr. Freeman that he was hearing voices of his father in his head. But at first, Dr. Freeman thought that this wasn't too far from normal things that someone in that deep of a depression could experience. Hearing his father's voice in his head seemed like pretty normal right after the loss of his father it seemed like a coping mechanism that he was going through. Either way, because of the mental health struggles that Zach was facing, he was prescribed Zoloft to help him manage his symptoms. But it seemed that pretty quickly after his therapy started, Melanie pulled him out. I haven't seen exactly what happened, but court documents list that Melanie was angry with Dr. Freeman for whatever reason, so she stopped having Zach receive therapy from him. In the months and years that followed, Zach's depression seemed to just get worse. Zach stopped showering, only cleaning himself once in a while. He wore the same hoodie day after day, even on days that it was warm out. He didn't talk to anybody, including his mom, his brother, and grandmother, who made it a point to see him and Josh on the weekends whenever she could. His grandmother said that for the years after his father died, he would often go into catatonic or zombie-like states. He would speak in whispers, and he was always very monotone and emotionless. It's also been reported that Zach told Melanie that he continued hearing his father's voice in his head, but it didn't really seem like she did anything about it. Now, it didn't seem like him being quiet and to himself was that big of an issue in Melanie's eyes. According to Gail, when she brought up the issue with Melanie, she just shrugged it off as Zach being a quiet kid. She said that she was quiet too, so they both just kept to themselves. That's just how their personalities were. By all accounts, after Chris's death, Melanie truly tried to do what she could to heal herself from the loss and did everything in her power to keep her boys happy as well. She wanted them to heal as well and grow into healthy, happy adults. But the night of August 10th, 2012 changed everything. On that evening, 15-year-old Zach and his 16-year-old brother, Josh, went to the movies with their mother. They watched the comedy movie, The Campaign, and by all accounts, Zach was laughing, smiling, and having a great night. They all returned home that night, with each of them going into their respective rooms. Josh went into his mother's room that night to tell her good night as she was finishing up some workouts before bed. However, by the early morning hours of August 11th, 2012, 911 received a phone call to report a house fire in Hendersonville, Tennessee. When firefighters arrived to the scene, they entered the burning home to find that there was someone still inside. They found 48-year-old Melanie Davis lying on her bed. When they found her, they found that she was absolutely covered in blood 
and her face was completely disfigured. At that point, it was obvious to first responders that there was much more going on here than just a house fire. Now, neither of the two boys were in the home, but firefighters quickly found Josh who had been at a neighbor's house. Turns out he had been sleeping when he was awoken by the fire alarm. He first got up and looked for his mother, only to find that her bedroom door was locked. So he broke the door down to get her out of her room, but he found that she was already dead. So he ran outside of the home to escape the fire and ran to a neighbor's house for his safety. But Josh had no idea where his brother was and neither did the authorities. Hours passed with authorities looking everywhere for Zach until five hours later after the 911 call, when authorities found Zach wandering alone aimlessly on a two-lane road several miles away from the family home. Some sources state that he was five miles away, with some sources claiming he was many as 10 miles away from the home. He was found carrying a backpack and a satchel. Inside of his pockets, police found a pocket knife, an X-Acto knife, earplugs, a cigarette lighter, tissues, and a set of keys. He was also carrying his school ID as well as a notebook. He was immediately apprehended and taken into the police station without incident. When he was in the interrogation room for questioning, reports state that Zach almost immediately confessed to killing his mother that night. Zach explained to the police that after returning home from the movies that night with his brother and his mom at around 9 p.m., everybody went to bed. But instead of going to bed, Zachary went to his room and started packing several items into his backpack, including clothing, notebooks, a toothbrush, gloves, a ski mask, and a claw hammer. After packing these items, Zach went into the basement where he grabbed a sledgehammer. Then he snuck into his mother's room and hit her in the head with the sledgehammer at least eight times or as many as 16 times. When her body was sent to the medical examiner, he said that she could have been hit at least eight times, but it could have been more, which is why they say between eight and 16. They aren't exactly sure exactly how many times. In the interrogation room, when he was asked why he used a sledgehammer, he said that he was worried he would miss if he used any other weapon. He said that using a sledgehammer gave the highest chance of actually killing her. He said that he was actually laughing when he was killing his mother. Then detectives asked him if he loved his mother and he said, somewhat. He was asked several times if he thought it was funny and he said, I don't know. Then he was asked why he killed his mother and he said he didn't know why. Then after hitting his mother with the sledgehammer multiple times, he left his mother's room, closing and locking the door behind him. Then he put the sledgehammer in a utility room nearby. Then he walked to the game room of the home. Here, he poured gasoline and whiskey all over the walls and floors of the room before lighting a match and setting the room on fire. Then he closed the doors of the game room and fled the home. His hope was that Josh would get stuck in the house as it burnt down and that he too would die, but from the fire. But just a few minutes after the fire started, the smoke alarm started to go off, which as I mentioned earlier, woke Josh up, alerting him to the fire. And again, he found his mother beaten and disfigured before he too fled the house. Thankfully, Zach closed the door of the game room so the fire didn't spread throughout the rest of the home. Closing the door made it so the fire lacked the oxygen that it would need to spread so the damage wasn't too severe to the home, which did allow Josh to get out. After setting the house on fire and fleeing, Zach took his backpack, which he had packed earlier, and was planning to leave and never come back. He also threw his cell phone into a nearby ditch so that police wouldn't be able to trace it and find him. While making this confession, police asked him basically if he could go back in time, would he still carry out the attack the way that he did? And he said that he would but he would go back and kill Josh with the sledgehammer too, because again, he wanted to murder his brother as well, but the smoke alarms alerted him before it did so. Something went on at your house today and I'd just kind of like you to kind of tell us what happened. I killed my mom and her sledgehammer. Um, is there a reason why you did that? Yes, sir. Well, can you tell me why? 
Like I mentioned before, Zachary was found with a notebook in his possession. In that notebook, it contained a detailed confession of murdering his mother, but there were other entries as well. The confession was dated August 10th, and then there was another entry dated August 11th, which was written in a different colored pen. In that August 10th entry, he wrote that he was raped by his older brother, Joshua, shortly after the family moved to Hendersonville. In that journal entry, he wrote, I was raped by him that day and I've been planning to kill him ever since. He went on to write that he hardly bathed to avoid being raped. He wrote that he started cutting his wrists, but his mother found out and threatened to send him to a mental hospital if he continued. Then in the August 11th entry, he wrote, I killed Melanie and left Josh alone to suffer. I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel remorse. My only true regret was that I didn't give her a faster death. I didn't want her to suffer. It was said that throughout Zachary's confession, he kept smiling and laughing at inappropriate times. He spoke in a low, monotone voice. He was very off-putting and investigators just felt like something was very, very wrong with Zachary. So for this case, the facts are pretty clear. Zach killed his mother and attempted to kill his brother. So by August 13th, Zach was charged with first degree murder. But the biggest question with this case was not whether he did it. It was more so whether he was mentally capable of understanding right from wrong and if he was competent to stand trial. So he was subject to a competency hearing which took place on January 13th, 2014. During that hearing, Dr. Sandra Phillips said that she examined Zachary several times throughout the course of the two years that he awaited trial in jail. 
She said that she determined that Zachary was psychotic. She said that he exhibits symptoms such as unclear or confused thinking. She said that Zachary heard voices for years. For the time before the murders, he resisted what the voices were telling him to do, but she said that Zachary said that the voices, which were in his dad's voice, were telling him to kill his family. So, in August, he did just that. Dr. Phillips testified that he was experiencing paranoid delusions, saying that he was worried that the guards at the jail were trying to poison him. He doesn't understand the gravity of the situation that he's in, and even though he can explain what can happen to him as a result of what he did, he shows no emotional response to any of it. He spoke in a very flat, monotone voice ever since middle school, which is consistent with disorders like schizophrenia. She said that Zach is not malingering or exaggerating his symptoms to appear insane. She said that he's had these symptoms long before he killed his family, so she thinks that they are real. Then Dr. Friedman, who we discussed earlier as the original psychiatrist that Zachary saw when he was younger, he also examined Zachary after the murder. He explained that Zach was hesitant to divulge any information to him because he was suspicious of Dr. Friedman's intentions. He described Zachary as robotic, unemotional, and suspicious. He believes that Zach meets the criteria for schizophrenia and major depressive disorder. He believes that he was experiencing psychosis. He said that with medication, he may improve his ability to stand trial, but as it stands, he did not think that he was able to adequately assist with his own defense or stand trial. However, there were two other psychiatrists that testified at the hearing who thought that even though Zachary did show obvious signs of a mental health disorder, such as major depressive disorder, he appeared well composed and he was able to speak with enough clarity about what happened that they believed him to be fully competent. Dr. Samuel Craddock testified that he did not agree with the previous psychiatrists in their diagnosis of schizophrenia. There was also a question of whether Zachary possibly fell on the autism spectrum due to his difficulty with social situations and the way that he spoke with little emotion. But both Dr. Craddock and the other psychiatrist, Dr. Farrick, they both agreed that they did not think that Zachary fell on the spectrum. He may have had some autistic-like symptoms, their words, not mine, but they did not think that he fell on the spectrum. They said that he showed normal conversation and social interaction skills, even though he spoke with that low, monotone voice. There were also questions on whether Zachary wanted to harm himself or posed a risk of doing so while in jail. He had expressed on multiple occasions thoughts and plans to harm himself while in jail to all of the psychiatrists who evaluated him. But as they progressed through their sessions, those behaviors decreased. And it got to a point that Dr. Craddock and Dr. Farrick both thought that he was no longer a danger to himself. And again, they believe that even through that, that he fully understood the nature and the object of the criminal proceedings. He knew how the process would play out. He understood guilt versus innocence. They believe that he was able to consult with his trial counsel and he was able to assist with his own defense. They did not find any mental illness that would prohibit him from conversing with his trial counsel and defending himself. Is that counsel, Dan? How old are you, Zach? Just turned 16. Yeah. Well, that's good. We've heard talk about you hearing voices. When no one's there. Do you hear voices then? Yes. Can you tell the judge? Do you recognize that voice? It's the voice of my father. Okay. And does he continue to talk with you even after you've been in the jail? Yeah. How often does your father talk to you? But how often? Every night? Usually several times a week. And have you told the doctors that? Yeah. 
Did you tell Dr. Farouk that? When your father talks to you, what, what kinds of things does he say to you? Mostly just conversation. Okay. Has he ever told you to do anything specifically? He sometimes tells me things to do, but it's mostly just conversation between us. Do, do, do you do the things your father asks you to do? So at the end of the competency hearing, it was found that he was able to understand all proceedings of the trial. They found that he was able to explain his own symptoms as well as what he did. He remembers why he did it, the way he did it, what he was doing, and that he knew it was wrong. While he did have trouble communicating his thoughts and feelings, the court said that this doesn't necessarily mean that he's not competent. They found that Zachary was competent to stand trial for the murder of his mother, and he was tried as an adult. The trial for murder took place on August 13th, 2015. The prosecution obviously argued that Zachary planned and executed the murder of his own mother. They said that it all started when the family lost Chris to ALS back in 2007. But after that, Melanie tried her very best to be a good single mother. She took very good care of her sons, and even after this tragedy, there was harmony in the home again. Then they outlined what happened that night. That while Melanie was sleeping soundly, Zachary planned her murder. He packed his bags, grabbed the sledgehammer, crept into her room, and hit her with the sledgehammer, fully intent on killing his mother. They showed her autopsy and confirmed her DNA was on the sledgehammer that they found in the home. They then showed the videotaped confession where he was emotionless, cold, and described what he did in great detail. Even as they showed the jury photos of the crime, which included a butcher knife that Zachary discarded as well as the bloody sledgehammer, her body lying in that bed brutally disfigured and bloody, her blood-soaked sheets, the gas can, the burned game room. Even through all of that, Zachary showed no emotion. He said that there's no question that Zachary is guilty of this and that he is fully aware of what he did. But the defense was now saying that Zachary didn't do it. Zach took the stand in his own defense and in trial, he actually said that he took the fall for his brother, Joshua. He continued to talk about the voices that he heard in his head, but this time he was saying that the voices were telling him to take the blame for his brother. He said that it was actually Joshua who killed their mother with a sledgehammer. He said that he took the fall because he still loved his brother, and after his mother was murdered, he found the sledgehammer that was used. And instead of letting his brother get in trouble, he decided to take the fall for it. Not because he and Josh had planned to do this together, it was a snap decision to take the fall because his dad's voice in his head was telling him to. The defense said that the reason he confessed to the murder on that tape was because he suffered from a severe mental defect that went untreated. The defense questioned Harmony in the home, saying that Zachary was suffering from hallucinations and delusions, which told him to kill his mother, but all she did was ignore his mental health issues. Then they talked about the rape allegations. Again, like I said earlier, Zach claimed that Josh had actually brutally raped him. Again, like I said earlier, Zachary claimed that Josh had brutally raped him. He said that he told his mom, but she didn't believe him. He said that she even threatened to send him to a mental institution if he continued his self-harm behavior. An investigator followed up on these allegations with the Department of Child Services, who said that there was no evidence that Zachary was raped by his brother. Josh also said that he only learned of the rape allegation after his mother was killed. He denied the allegation completely and said that it's ridiculous that Zach would even say that. Now, I do want to be fair here and say that there isn't always going to be evidence of rape. I think going solely off of physical evidence is unfair because oftentimes there just isn't any especially if the rape took place years prior, as it's being alleged in this case. 
It's such a difficult thing to investigate and I want to be fair on both sides. It's absolutely possible, though he didn't talk much about it in the psychiatrist evaluations as far as I read. As far as I saw, he never brought up the rape or any other type of allegations against his brother before the murders. They only came out after. But again, he had trouble sharing his thoughts and his feelings, so it might be something that he didn't want to talk about. Rape is one of the worst things that a person could possibly go through, so I can definitely see why he wouldn't want to tell his therapist about this in the beginning and only mention it after the murder, after it had been boiling under the surface for so long. But at the same time, falsely accusing someone of rape is also one of the worst things that you can do to someone. That is a very serious allegation, and if it's a false report, it can truly ruin someone's life. And again, because it's so hard to investigate, a lot of times these false rape allegations are stated as fact and people just accept the claims as true and even when they come out to be false, that person's life is still ruined. So again, I want to be fair on both sides. I'm not going to state for a fact whether or not it happened because we truly don't know. I want to believe Zach if he truly is a victim but I also want to believe Josh if he denies it because I don't want to pin something so horrible on an innocent person. Obviously, Josh is going to deny it whether he did it or not, but I do want to be fair on both sides as much as possible. So I mentioned it because it was a part of the trial. It was a huge part of this case, but that is all I'm going to say on that. Then the prosecution talked about the other dark things that they discovered about Zachary. Turned out he had two disturbing apps on his phone. One app talked about serial killers. They found out that he had a deep interest in serial killers, having read about them and studied them long before he committed the murder. Then they found another app that listed all kinds of torture devices, which again is very concerning for a 15 year old to be looking at. Then he had another notebook which had all types of different quotes like, you can't spell laughter without slaughter. The prosecution also argued that he hadn't actually said that he heard voices until after he was arrested. This was a fact that was very difficult for me to confirm or deny because a lot of sources report things differently. Some sources state that he mentioned that he heard voices as early as 2007, right after his father died, but that was according to his grandmother but the prosecution argued that he didn't actually mention it until after the murder. So again, we don't truly know for sure. The prosecution argued that Zachary was an evil teenager who turned to the dark side and murdered his mother, plain and simple. But Zachary's grandmother, Gail, testified at trial and said that he was experiencing terrible mental health issues from the time his father died. As we discussed earlier, she told the courts that he was monotone, emotionless, flat, and mentally disturbed for years. She believed that he was hearing voices and that he was schizophrenic. She said that everybody at school, his teachers, his guidance counselor, other students, as well as his own mother, all knew that something was wrong, yet nobody did anything. Gail said that Zachary is not a monster. He is a child who made a horrible mistake. She went as far as saying that every teacher and guidance counselor should have to stand trial with him. He said that his mother didn't get him the help that he needed. She said that if he got the mental health help that he needed, that he would not have committed the crime that he did and they wouldn't be at trial right now. Throughout the trial, it was noted that Zachary exhibited strange, poorly timed bouts of laughter, he also showed no emotion or any remorse like I stated. So at the end of the trial, the jury was sent off for their deliberations. They found that Zachary was guilty of first degree murder, premeditated murder, as well as attempted first degree murder and aggravated arson. The jury went on to say that although Zachary clearly suffered from a mental health issues, they found his lack of emotion, lack of remorse, and ill-timed laughter disturbing. They felt that he knew that what he was doing was wrong. 
So he was sentenced to life behind bars for the murder, and then an additional 20 years for the attempted murder of Josh, which would run consecutively with his life sentence. After the conviction, of course, Zachary's defense appealed. They argued that the court was wrong in their decision that he was competent to stand trial. They said that the court should have suppressed the confession and not allow it to be used as evidence in trial. They said that a juvenile should never be subject to a life sentence. And as of right now, I do believe that he has not been approved for appeal and that he is serving his sentence for now. So that is all of the information that I have on today's case. Obviously, this was a tough case overall because I do think that Zach was clearly struggling with mental illness. I think that it's possible that he just had this built-up resentment towards his mother for one reason or another, and for whatever reason, he just snapped and killed her. I do think that he was planning it for quite some time, even if it was just that day, but I do think he had in the back of his head that he wanted to kill her for a very long time, and I think he finally acted on it. Again, I don't know what to think about the allegations with his brother, but I don't want to speculate too much on that. Again, if it's true that Melanie didn't get Zach the mental help that he needed, that's obviously something that shouldn't have happened. She obviously should have been more attentive to his needs, but she did not deserve this one way or another. But now I want to know what you all think. Why do you think this happened? Do you think Zach truly was mentally equipped to stand trial? What do you think of the confession and what do you think about the attempted murder of his brother? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have on this case in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you check out my Facebook as well as my Twitter and Instagram. All of those will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form that is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.